Welcome everyone to today's Sustainable Farming Association, also known as the SFA, Soil Health Webinar. I am Wayne Munson, the Project Coordinator for the Keep Cattle Minnesota Project, and I am serving as the moderator for the webinar. It is great to have you with us. I'd like to acknowledge the Pasture Project at Winrock International for supporting this project. The Pasture Project is also providing the technical support for today's webinar. This webinar is a program of the Keep Cattle in Minnesota project. The mission of this program is to sustain the beef and dairy industries while protecting and enhancing our vast environmental resources. Today's webinar will focus on how cover crops, with or without livestock, improve soil health. Cover crops can protect soil, provide nutrients to crops, extend grazing seasons, increase wildlife habitat, to name a few benefits. Our presenter today is Kent Solberg. Kent is the Livestock and Grazing Specialist with the SFA and also a dairy farmer in central Minnesota. Kent has a lot of experience growing cover crops as well as helping farmers with ideas for their farm. And Kent is a great educator. After the presentation, we will have some time for Kent to answer questions. Now I'll turn it over to Kent for his presentation. Thank you, Wayne. Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. Glad you could all join us. Hope you're having a great week and enjoying beautiful weather like we are in Minnesota today. Uh, let's jump right in here and talk about how cover crops, uh, how we can implement cover crops in our situations. There we go. So why why cover crops? Why are we even interested them in, in them in our farms and our cropping system? Well, cover crops are a tool we can use to promote soil health. Just so we're all on the same page, I'm going to go through a few definitions here. First is what is soil health? When we're talking about soil health, we're basically talking about the soil's ability to function. Whoops, excuse me. Getting the feel for the technology here. There we go. Soil function is the ability to capture and store water and the ability to cycle nutrients. Now, our ability to capture and store water comes from good soil aggregate structure. And soil aggregate structure is the result of healthy and active soil microbial communities. And healthy and active soil microbes need to be fed and have a home kind of like our other livestock on the farm. In fact, some people consider the soil microbes our unseen livestock, but we need to take care and manage them as such. So how do we care for them? Well, it's pretty straightforward. They need to be fed. And we usually feed the bulk of uh, the soil microbes through the addition of soil organic matter or carbonaceous material. Now, some eat other things, but this is pretty much the fuel that drives the system. And then they need a home. And when we provide a home for our soil microbes, we're talking about number one, offering a living root zone. And a living root zone needs a living plant. Most of our crops out there maybe have a living root associated with them about a third of the entire year. Some of them not even that. Um, and we'll get more into that later. They also need shelter from the elements. And we often call this soil armor. And we'll be discussing more of that as we go here. I want to quick go over some of the five major principles, uh, or the five major principles of soil health. Some of you have seen this before. Uh, this is a small magnet uh, that we put together as a reminder to folks that we've been passing out at some of our events and workshops. So this is familiar to some of you folks. The key soil health principles are number one, keep the soil covered at all times, or as much as possible. Number two, minimize soil disturbance. Number three, increase crop diversity. Four, keep living roots in the soil. And five, integrate livestock. Excuse me there. Uh, let's go over these one at a time just so you can understand how they relate to cover crops. Because if you'll notice in that list, cover crops was not part of that list. And yet cover crops are a tool that we can use to help move forward with each one of these principles. So let's start with the first one, keep the soil covered. 
here's a shot of a cover crop field. This was on our farm last fall in the uh, upper part of the picture there. You'll notice a cow pie with a hoof print in it. This is after the cattle have been through here and grazed. But you notice there's very little, if any, bare soil here. We're keeping that soil covered with soil armor, and that soil armor is providing protection and a home for our soil microbes. Minimizing soil disturbance, the second principle of soil health. Cover crops can uh, serve as providing a mulch layer that can suppress weeds, and we can use this as a way to no-till our crop directly into it. Number three, increase crop diversity. Here's a complex cover crop blend that was built into a rotation. And by using these complex blends, uh, we can build diversity and provide more opportunity for a broader array of soil microbes. Many soil microbes, particularly mycorrhizal fungi, are associated with very specific plants. And so diversity can help give us the broadest diversity in that microbe community. When we talk about crop diversity, we're talking about including at least one representative from each of the four major crop groups, including the warm season grasses, such as corn, millets, and sorghum, warm season broadleaves, such as sunflower, soybean, and cowpea, cool season grasses, such as oat, wheats, or annual ryegrass, and then cool season broadleaves, such as clovers, turnips, and field peas. Again, keeping a living root in the soil, so important for providing a home for soil microbes. Um, and number five, integrating livestock. Cover crops can be the bridge between cropping systems and getting livestock back out onto a particular field. And that's important because science is yet to replicate basically in the jug or a bag what comes out of the back end of these livestock. And it's also, there's also things we probably don't even realize the importance of on having those livestock out there, such as milk foam off nursing calves or lambs, shed hair, uh, even the saliva off those animals is probably having some degree of influence on the soil micro community. We're just basically scratching the surface on understanding some of those relationships. So let's move into integrating livestock, or integrating, excuse me, cover crops into our system. It's about a four-step process to do this. The first is identify the issues or resource concerns that you're trying to address for that particular field. And I'd like to encourage you to think about just picking one field to work with. Um, don't try and take on the whole farm at once if this is something that's new to you. Uh, just pick one field. In fact, I'd even challenge you to think about taking one of your worst fields and starting and using some of these and applying some of these principles too. You really have the most to gain here and you probably have the least to lose. So what are your resource concerns? Well, maybe it's providing feed for your livestock or extending the grazing season. Maybe it's dealing with a compaction issue or a soil aggregate structure issue. Maybe it's providing soil armor to minimize or prevent wind erosion. Or maybe it's to build some diversity into your cropping system. And maybe you have a strong interest in wildlife. Identifying one or more of these concerns is the first step in moving towards implementing cover crops on your system. Number two, determine how cover crops fit into your broader cropping plan. There's a number of considerations here including your cropping history and your future cropping plans. For example, if it's a field that was in corn last year, you probably don't need to include corn in a cover crop blend or cover crop mix. A lot of people do, but it's uh, generally considered a good practice to keep that out just to help break some of those pest and disease cycles. And then what are your future cropping plants? If you're going to follow your cover crop with soybeans, really no need to keep have soybeans in in a complex cover crop mix if that's what you choose to use. Herbicide history is very important, and I'll be touching on that in a, little, in a few moments here. What's your general soil type? Some cover crops work better in certain soil types than others, so it's something to be thinking about. And how are you going to terminate this cover crop? There's several options out there. If this is new to you, if you haven't used cover crops before, I'd encourage you to 
find cover crops that can be frost terminated, especially if you're in the northern part of the U.S. We have lots of options available uh, to us, particularly if you're north of I-80. Uh, it just makes it that much simpler and easier. If you already have an herbicide uh, plant in your cropping history, herbicide is probably the second simplest choice. Some of the other ones are a little tricky, uh, and not that they can't be done, uh, but they're probably for somebody who's a little more advanced in what they're doing. We want to help you have success early on in your cover cropping use, so I suggest you use some of the more simpler techniques for cover crop termination. I brought up before considerations uh, for herbicides. Uh, this is a website from the University of Wisconsin that you can go to. Uh, Herbicide Rotation Restrictions in Forage and Cover Cropping Systems is the title of the article. It's a downloadable PDF that you can either print out on hard copy or just store in your computer. There are charts in here that talk about some of the restrictions. And if you're planning on using your cover crop as a forage for livestock, this is particularly important. And again, if you can't find this or don't have access to this, as we always like to remind folks, please read and follow all label directions. Practical Farmers of Iowa also has some information on the, their website, so use what's handiest to you. But I do encourage you to check uh, before you move forward with some of this and ensure that your herbicide program is not going to be in conflict with any cover crops you want to utilize. Step three, check with your insurance provider. Um, some applications of cover crops can null and void your crop insurance, so we definitely want to check with that. If you're involved in any government programs, for example, EQIP or CSP, please check with the uh, NRCS USDA office and make sure there's not going to be any complications there. The rules are changing um, fairly frequently, and it's just good to check before you get yourself in trouble. And number four, develop and implement your cover crop plan. Now, as much as we'd like to be able to do a plan, say, in March here, and be able to roll with it this summer, we can't control the weather. And that can play a big factor in the success or failure of, of some cover crop plan. I'd encourage you to be flexible. We'll be talking about some of those uh, times uh, where you need to be flexible in your cropping as we go on here today. But flexibility, like in so many other things, is important. So you may even want to have a plan B, particularly depending on when you can get uh, some of your first crops in the ground this spring and you plan on following those with cover crops. You can kind of get a rough idea on what might work for you and what might not. Here's some resources that are available uh, to you online that can help with your cover crop planning. This is a cover crop chart available through the Mandan ARS lab. It's downloadable. Uh, it includes uh, a, a broad array of information. Not everything's on here. Uh, that's one thing we really don't have is one-stop shopping for cover crop stuff, but uh, I'll give you some of the easier places to find information. Uh, when you do download this chart onto your computer, you'll be able to click on one of these squares. For example, like Turnip here, you'll be able to click on it, and it'll bring up a page that will have some uh, factors related to using turnips as cover crop. And then at the bottom of the page, you can click and come back to this chart and check out something else, say like Field Pea. It just gives you uh, kind of a quick overview on what some of the characteristics of these cover crops are and how they might fit in your system. Here's another resource, and Jeff, if you could bring that up, please, the first one. Sure thing. This is with the Midwest Cover Crop Council. It's a multi-state project. Whoops, we went too far. There we go. And this is a cover crop decision tool that the Midwest Cover Crop Council developed. Uh, you should be able to go on here and select your state. We'll go to Minnesota, since I'm in Minnesota. And we'll pick a county here, we'll go to Blue Earth, and then you should get a table. There we go. You should get a table here that gives you species over here on the left side, and then suggested planting dates for each one of those crop species. So let's say you have, a, for example, a grain crop or something that you think you're going to be able to take off in the latter part of July. 
if you look between July 15th and August 1st here and go down this column, they give you some suggestions on cover crops where those planting dates have a pretty good chance of succeeding for you. Very handy little tool if you're not familiar with some of the attributes of each of these cover crops here. Okay, let's go back to the other one. There we go. Uh, here's another resource. This is just really handy for learning more uh, uh, about each one of these cover crops. Um, if you scroll down, you can go to literature on grasses or literature on legumes or brassicas, whichever you want. I'm just going to go to grasses here. Let's say we have an interest in learning more about annual ryegrass. We click on that and all of these publications concerning annual ryegrass are available for you online. Here's just one example. This is out of, book, out of a book called Managing Cover Crops Profitably. That entire book is available online for download for free, but this is one way to kind of index uh, your way through it and uh, quickly find what you're looking for. All right. That. Thank you. Another resource uh, is an online uh, calculator that's available um, for putting together complex cover crop blends. This is the website to get there. Uh, I'm not going to go to that directly, but this is one of the calculators uh, that's available. This is their older version. Uh, I happen to kind of like this one because I'm comfortable with it and I can go in here and uh, just play around with some things and see what's going to work in, in a particular setting to address particular uh, resource issues or concerns on a field I'm working with. Uh, you do need to fill out the information on top here. It's all drop-down boxes. Uh, and then there's drop-down boxes by category over here on the left side, like leaves, grasses, broadleaves, and so on. And you can put in your pounds per acre uh, and just start messing around with cover crop blends and see what you can come up with. There's one box here, this one here, percent, percent full rate. That's the one you really want to watch as you push your blend together. And what we're shooting for here is a percent, about 120 to 145 percent full rate. Uh, that's kind of what we're finding uh, is working best for most people. Uh, if you're broadcasting, probably want to go to the higher end. And if you're drilling, probably at the lower end. But right in that ballpark seems to work really well. And on most blends, not all, but on most blends, you're going to end up with about all around 750,000 to a million seeds per acre. Uh, this one's nice. It'll also give you a cost estimate over here. And uh, it's just really handy to work with. I know there's, I'm familiar with a few other ones out there, but this one's just very readily available. And uh, the folks at Green Cover Seed have done a very nice job at putting this together and making it available. They do have other versions of this available, and check those out also. Okay, let's let's get into some specific applications here. Uh, here we've got some cover crops that were seeded in a cornfield. Um, application of cover crops in, into row crop systems is probably where the highest level of interest is across the country, and yet at the same time, uh, this is some of the most challenging applications of cover crops. Like with most farming, uh, putting cover crops in is very much dependent on timing and moisture and enough moisture at the right time is critical to any success. Uh, if you irrigate, you're going to have your best chance uh, of success because you can control that to a large degree. You're not dependent on the weather. Uh, and this is extremely critical if you want to do cover crops into soybeans, uh, making sure we get enough moisture out there. We're finding that getting cover crops uh, seed in a, a little bit earlier rather than later uh, it increases your chance of success. If we get the cover crops on too late in a row crop situation, uh, we start to lose day length, we start to use, lose heat units, and this generally results in a poorer stand. So we're probably looking at getting them in sooner or later. This crop's still fairly green. Uh, we got this in. This, this was flown on uh, by fixed-wing aircraft in uh, late August. So this uh, picture was taken about the second week in September. And we can see pretty decent germination uh, uh, in here. 
As far as uh, flying on and seeding methods, um, in general throughout the Corn Belt, and there are some exceptions obviously, or some people have had different degrees of success. Uh, uh, helicopter oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes can be cheaper. Primary reason being the distance they have to travel from the site where they load the seed on to the field. Fixed string aircraft, pretty much got to go back to an airport type situation. And the distance from your airport is going to play, uh, uh, play a large factor in what the cost of getting that cover crop seed out there is. Uh, one of the issues we've seen with helicopters occasionally is the spread is not as even because of the downdraft from the helicopter, so something to think about and watch. On fixed wing aircraft, bigger blocks of crops we tend to be able to do a better job with. Also the more acres that we have, particularly on the fixed wing aircraft, it's easier to attack, attract the pilot and oftentimes uh, groups of farmers in a given area will go together to start getting enough acres to make it attractive. Something to watch uh, with aerial seeding of cover crops and um, where we can have some problems is wind speed. Uh, winds of greater than, for example, five to seven miles per hour, especially if we want to use annual ryegrass, can be problematic. Uh, but on the flip side, uh, aerial application does not matter how wet the field is. We can still get the seed out there. For other applications, uh, that's a little tougher to do, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Usually we're seeing our best results with about 25 to 30 pounds of seed per acre. Uh, even with blends, uh, one of the biggest problems I think we're seeing is just cutting way too far back on seeding rates, and we're getting, excuse me, poor... Uh, poor germination, poor establishment, and very thin stems. Common cover crops that are used uh, in row crop applications are cereal rye, annual ryegrass, crimson clover, radish, maybe some of the hybrid brassicas. Uh, but there definitely is a learning curve for pilots here. And, uh, and, and work with them. Work as a team. I'd encourage you to work as a team uh, to try and learn from what you're doing and to try and get better over time with that application and spread and how they get that out of there. One of the things uh, we would encourage you to uh, avoid is using brassicas with soybeans. Um, unfortunately, what can happen is uh, when the brassicas are planted in the fall and soybeans are reaching maturity, we can get into situations where conditions are right, rapid growth of those brassicas, and yet we can't get in the field and harvest those combines. And if those brassicas get too tall, uh, that's not going to bode well for your combining experience. So something to keep in mind. Usually we're pretty much limited to things like annual ryegrass, oats, or cereal rye on soybeans, with cereal rye being the most, most common or the most popular. Some folks are using high boy seeders. Uh, these can be uh, uh, applied to a standing row crop situation without knocking down a lot of corn. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, yield loss, but uh, estimations uh, out of work being done in Indiana on this, just as an example, is showing that yield loss uh, from turning uh, the high boy on end rows is about one quarter of a percent uh, yield loss uh, on that field. So it's very tiny. Uh, again, um, it doesn't work well in wet fields, very wet fields, but it can work quite well in windy conditions, especially with drop tube type seeders. And there's some really good YouTube videos out there if you want to see some of these in action, if you want to see some of the modifications that have been done, uh, check some of those out uh, on YouTube. Some other options uh, for seeding in row crops is broadcasting at the V5, V6 stage on corn. This can work extremely well on things like silage corn. We're having some success with it. Another option with silage corn is following right behind with the no-till drill, especially if uh, that silage is coming off on or around or even before September 1st, uh, as it does in some parts of the country. This is not always feasible, and it depends on your growing season, uh, but it's something that if you choose to go this route, you want to be right behind that forage box. Waiting could cost you uh, the opportunity to get something established. Some producers are blending their cover crop seed with fertilizer and spreading it on. 
this is one of the lower cost uh, rates to do it. Usually co-ops will uh, be able to do this without any additional charge if you're, you're using the fertilizer. So it may be a situation to consider uh, for your farm. Uh, winter grains are something that are often, in hairy vetch, uh, are often drilled immediately behind silage harvest, and that's, that's primarily what most folks are using there. Okay, let's move on. Uh, livestock grazing crop residue. This is really a great way to integrate livestock into your cropping systems. I'm seeing more and more of this uh, throughout the Midwest. And covers can play a big role here uh, in improving the quality and quantity of feed that's out there. By establishing um, some covers into this cornfield, uh, we can provide a more balanced ration for those animals and improve the health benefits by diversifying uh, what's out there and keeping a living root uh, out there in that field uh, well into the fall. If this is something you would like to do, uh, if you have livestock or access to livestock and you'd like to do this, uh, you may want to consider on the particular field you want to do this using a shorter day corn variety. Uh, being able to get it off a little bit earlier, providing a little more sunlight uh, to those cover crops and maybe getting a little bit of growth, it may be something to consider. Uh, here's a field of a farmer who is quite innovative in integrating cover crops into his system. This field was planted to a mix that included oats, field pea, several brassicas, and a clover. The oats and field pea were taken off as hay uh, in, in late June, and then uh, everything else was allowed to grow up underneath. This picture was taken, I believe, in September. And uh, this, uh, this was in 2013, this field, or when this was done. And there was a six-week period on this farm where this field did not receive any rain. In fact, uh, a broader area around here did not receive any rain during that period of time. And after six weeks of no rain in this country, there wasn't much left of those pastures. And yet this producer had the, uh, this kind of forage to move those cattle to. Uh, it worked extremely well for him. He was very happy with this. He says, I had the greenest pasture for miles around, and he was thrilled to have this forage crop available for his animals. Another option behind small grain, we've already talked about using the no-till drill uh, behind silage corn. Again, going in right behind small grain. Harvest, this thing should be following the combine uh, to get the greatest opportunity uh, for drilling things in. Uh, Following small grain or something like field peas is one of the best opportunities for getting cover crops into a rotation, uh, but it's also a, a situation where uh, one needs to be cognizant of what time of year it is and how much uh, uh, possible growing season we have left in the year, and flexibility is key. If you can get into something the first week in August, you have much more opportunities than if you're not going to be able to get into this field until the last week of August or even early September for some of our northern growers. So that kind of starts to limit your options. Again, flexibility is the key. If you know when you're getting it planted, you'll be able to estimate roughly a harvest date, and you can plan accordingly uh, and move on from there. Uh, here's another uh, innovative example of using cover crops. Uh, this field was an alfalfa field. The producer felt that the alfalfa was kind of petering out, so it looked its useful life. And he was looking to rotate this out, do some other things with it. And so what he did is took off uh, a first cutting of alfalfa in June and came back behind and uh, terminated that alfalfa and planted an eight-way cover crop mix here. This was allowed to grow until a hard freeze that fall in October, and then the first week in November, he turned cattle into this, and those cattle spent just short of six weeks grazing this, and it worked extremely well for those animals. Uh, that was hay he did not have to feed. It's typically a time, this is in central Minnesota, and it's typically a time of year when uh, most cattle producers are feeding hay. Uh, in fact, this worked so well for him uh, the following spring when he was in short supply and hay prices were high, he was able to sell his surplus hay 
uh, at a very, very nice price uh, because he just didn't need it because of this. The following year, 2014, uh, this field was planted to corn. This is dry land corn. It's fairly light soil. Uh, uh, yields tend not to be real high here, but uh, in 2014, his corn crop off this field was about 15 bushel an acre, higher than similar fields in that county, and he only used about half of the nitrogen fertilizer that he typically has used on his corn crop. And so with $3.50 corn, that worked out quite nicely for him. Uh, this is a field, this is a photo I just took uh, earlier in the week here. This is a field that had been uh, uh, worked up and planted to cereal rye after the harvest of the previous crop. And uh, that cereal rye did not get very tall, only about four or five inches tall uh, before it was frosted down and the snow came. Uh, but you can see there's not a lot of soil disturbance there versus uh, this picture of this other field that had been uh, worked up in the fall, but there's no cover crop and very little residue on there. Interesting thing about these pictures is they're taken from the exact same road. The picture in the upper left was taken looking to the south, and from the exact same road turning around 180 degrees and looking north, we're looking at uh, a field that did not have any cover crop planted on it. Uh, just a very powerful example of uh, how much even a light uh, cover crop uh, seeding can do to reducing uh, soil erosion problems. This picture is from uh, Brown's Ranch of Burley County, North Dakota, Gabe and Paul Brown. Uh, this was taken uh, during the grass-fed exchange tour of 2013. Uh, this picture was taken on August 20th of 2013. Uh, this, it was 100 degrees that day. Uh, this photo was taken about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and those cattle are contentedly munching out there. It's a 29-way uh, species cover crop blend, a very complex cover crop blend, the kind uh, Gabe is noted for, and uh, it looks like it's working extremely well, especially if we understand that this field was planted on June 26th, and between June 26th and August 20th, that field only received approximately four-tenths of an inch of rain. Uh, it really speaks to the power of diversity of cover crops, and look at how valuable this is to these livestock at this point in time. These cattle uh, would probably, in most situations, uh, after that little rain and in this hot of weather, be struggling to find pasture, and yet there's plenty of high-quality forage uh, here to eat uh, for them, as well as helping build soil fertility. If you are a livestock producer, if you do crops and livestock together, uh, there's just a tremendous opportunity here for productivity and profitability for your farm uh, when we start integrating uh, both livestock and our cropping system together. This is just a very powerful uh, example of that. This is from our farm. This is last fall uh, in November. Uh, this is just a shot to illustrate uh, using a different class of animal. Uh, we're running actually dairy cattle. We have a grass-based dairy. Uh, and they're grazing through uh, a, a cover crop field that was planted here last summer. It's showing the trampling. Uh, our, our goal here was for the animals to take about 40 or 50 percent of the above ground biomass and trample the rest in order to provide that soil armor. Uh, so why is trampling important? You hear about this trampling. Why is it important? Well, what it does is it gets that vegetation and those covers down near the soil surface where those soil, soil microbes can access them. Now, there's not going to be a lot of access when it's cold, but come the spring, that'll be down there available for them to take advantage of and convert to food. Uh, just a note, a side note on this, uh, that uh, these dairy animals, after they were done grazing this field, went on um, some pretty good quality, dairy quality hay and they actually dropped uh, a couple of pounds a day in milk production. And uh, I think that's just a, just a simple illustration of uh, how nutritious some of these cover crop blends can be. And they can actually perform well in, in a diet uh, where performance of those animals is, is very important. 
So maybe you're saying to yourself, well, Kent, I don't, I don't have any livestock. I really don't have any livestock, and this is all great. But, uh, uh, well, I tell you what, there's, there's some opportunities out there for you uh, to do this. Um, one of the options is a short-term grazing lease, and the Greenlands Blue Waters website uh, has uh, uh, four fact sheets available to help you put together a grazing lease um, and start to integrate uh, livestock onto your property. Uh, it also may be a way uh, to bring a young person back onto the farm. Uh, we have lots of young people interested in farming these days, and this may be an opportunity uh, to help them uh, move forward and get started through a grazing lease. And there's just some really good templates and outlines here to help you put that together. So that's pretty much what we have today. Uh, I do want to thank the Pasture Project uh, for uh, funding this work and be able to bring this to you today. And uh, SFA, again, this is a Keep Cattle in Minnesota project. And uh, I guess we're going to open it up to questions here, and I'll turn it back over to Wayne. Yeah, thanks, Kent, for your very informative presentation. And like Kent said, we do have some time for questions. So um, type away in the chat box and send them in. Um, here's one. Will frost seeded crops be weaker or easier to terminate than fall seeded winter grains? Will frost seeded? I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, could you say that again, please? Will frost seeded cover crops be weaker or easier to terminate than fall seeded cover crops? So, if you, I think what they mean is if you seeded rye in the fall versus frost seeded it in the spring. Oh, yeah, something like rye or triticale, you know, they're, they're uh, uh, winter, winter annuals anyway. Um, they're, they're designed to handle that. I don't know if they'd be any weaker uh, come spring than if they were seeded in the spring. Mm -hmm. um, I have not seen anything on that. Um, uh, the trick there is um, they are a little tougher uh, to terminate something that's frost seeded. Uh, timing is critical if you don't want to use herbicides, but they do terminate for the most part pretty well with herbicides. Uh, if you want to use tillage or mowing or crimping or something like that, uh, we need to do that when uh, the seed head is formed and they're just flowering, they're getting pollen on that seed head. Uh, that seems to be the time when they're most vulnerable. Do you have any input on what kind of a planter or the seed box or whatever if you're putting a big cocktail mixed together? Uh, yeah, that's always a big question that comes up. Um, people are finding that the John Deere and Great Plains tend to work real well, Great Plains drill. Um, some people are using some old press drills and having really good success uh, with that. Uh, the trick there is not filling the seed box full. Uh, when you put your blend together, only fill about a third of the seed box uh, with seed. Uh, it prevents some of that sifting that's going on. It's a little inconvenient because you have to load it more often, uh, uh, but it does tend to work. Uh, some of the other drills, for example, uh, we've done some work with the hay buster drill with three different boxes on it. What we found is that uh, the smaller seed can all go together in one box. Uh, things like the sorghums or the sedan grasses, uh, boy, they tend to flow like water, and they almost need their own box to be in, separate from everything else, at least in that style of drill. And then everything else, the bigger seed that's left over, we tend to put in the third box. Uh, calibration is very important. Uh, take the time and do a good job of calibrating. A lot of counties, so water districts and so on have, uh, in, in the Midwest have no-till no -till drills to, to rent uh, or lease on a per acre basis. Um, I'd encourage you to work with the technical person from that office to make sure your drill is calibrated with the mix you want to use uh, before you head out in the field. And it does take a little time, but it's time well spent. <clears throat> 
Okay, someone uh, sent in that they missed the part of the last point on lease and rent. Please go over the factors again. Uh, I didn't go too far into detail into the factors, but it is an option uh, for folks uh, who do not have livestock, and there's some good examples on the Greenlands Blue Waters website about putting together uh, lease options or contract raising options. Uh, yeah, there's four really good uh, fact sheets there that can give you a big chunk of the information you need to put something like that together if you're interested in doing that. Okay, thank you. Um, have you done or heard of any seeding being done with liquid with manure applications and how successful that is? Yes, there's some of that that's been done in uh, through Michigan State has been working on quite a bit of that um, and they've had some good success with slurry seeding. Uh, yeah, uh, Michigan State University has more information on that. So what's the best way to get cover crops into a corn and soybean system? The best way. The best way is probably diversifying your rotation and putting in something like a small grain or field pea uh, to create that broader window uh, to have a greater chance of success at getting that cover crop established and growing. And I know that's not something that uh, folks tend to get real excited about if, if they've traditionally done corn and beans and they're set up for that, but that's probably the best way. Okay, here's a question that goes back to the liquid manure. Do you need a waiver to do that kind of application? Do you know about that? A waiver to do the, the cover crops in the liquid manure? Yes. Uh, usually folks who are doing the liquid manure application with cover crops are knifing it in anyway, so um, I personally right now don't see any conflict with that. In Minnesota they require either to be injected in the soil or to be worked in within 24 hours, and if you're uh, doing your liquid manure application when the ground isn't frozen, which is what they require, uh, that shouldn't be a problem. It should work just fine. Okay. Do you have a rule of thumb for how much grazing can get on a field seeded to cover crops in later summer? Oh, not really because there's too many variables involved there. Uh, there's variables such as what you have in your cover crop mix. It totally depends on weather and moisture. depends on how many growing days we have left before hard freeze. Uh, what I would suggest is going out and measuring uh, what you have um, uh, before you begin grazing and then figure you want to take about half. There are some good calculators uh, uh, available um, for going in and determining approximately how much forage you have out there. Uh, the NRCS grazing sticks can be helpful uh, in putting that together or uh, grazing lands conservation. Uh, folks have put together these grazing sticks. Uh, basically, you're taking the amount of uh, available inches of forage times uh, so many pounds per acre. Typically, that's going to be in 150 to 200 pounds of dry matter available per acre inch. On a very, very good stand, it might be slightly higher than that, but probably better to be a little conservative. And then you can take how many inches of uh, available forage there. Let's say you have 24-inch uh, tall stand of cover crops. Uh, and you want to take half, so you're going to take about 12 inches off, 10 or 12 inches off. So let's just use the 10 inches for easy math times 150 pounds dry matter per acre inch. So 150 times 10, uh, you know, gives us... Uh, what, 1, 1,500 uh, pounds of, of available dry matter per acre. And if we figure 3% of our animal's body weight per day, so if we have a 1,000-pound animal, I'm doing the math in my head here, 1,000-pound uh, animal, we need, uh, on average, 1,000-pound animal, we need about 30 pounds of forage per day for them. And uh, we can divide 
uh, that 1,500 by 30 pounds, and we can get about, about 50, 50 head out there. No, yeah, I'm not doing my math very well in my head here. Uh, but, uh, yeah, you can do the math and uh, estimate how many animals per acre per day you can have out there and multiply that over the number of acres of cover crop is a way to estimate that. Okay, here's a, can you share any strategies or resources on implementing cover crops in vegetable production? Vegetable production, I think the same principles, you know, for the most part are going to apply. It's just uh, scaling them um, to your situation. The biggest thing is probably diversifying uh, your rotation and creating an opportunity for those cover crops. If you have early vegetables coming off, uh, look at what else is in your vegetable rotation and fill in the gap with one of those, excuse me, major crop type categories that's missing in that rotation and use it uh, at the end of the year. Uh, there are people using blends. There are people using uh, winter annuals that are they're, they're mowing down in the spring and planting into the mulch. Uh, there's people that are doing some companion planting type stuff. Uh, there's lots of different options out there. I think even on vegetables, we're just uh, tapping the surface on how we can use uh, cover crops out there. Uh, but I go back to the principles, those basic principles of soil health, and see how you can uh, interject cover crops into your, your production schedule. Okay, here's one. What is a good mix of cover crop in central Minnesota to put on a primarily hay field to extend into fall for pasture beef cattle? What we find in hay field applications is it's very difficult to get annuals established in there without terminating that hay field. Uh, the competition from those other grasses make it, make it very hard. Uh, and the other problem then is is moisture. A lot of times in central Minnesota, you know, that rain can shut off early to mid July and we don't see rain again until September. That's not uncommon. Uh, so uh, timing and moisture are difficult competition, something to deal with. Uh, one of the things you could try is going in and taking a hay crop off or grazing it really hard and then coming back five days later and grazing it really hard again. We have to hurt that competition from those perennials. We have to set it back in order to have any chance of getting those annuals going. If it's an alfalfa field and there's a lot of bare ground showing, you may have a better chance of making that happen than if there's a strong sod layer there. The stronger the sod layer, uh, the more likely you're going to have to go in and, and basically kill that. Uh, and that's to avoid uh, on some of the examples I gave uh, where we went in and took off first crop hay and then we followed right behind with terminating that hay crop and putting that cover crop in. We did that to avoid the competition and have a better chance of success. So if that's something you're interested in doing, maybe identify hay fields that have kind of lived their life. The alfalfa is maybe petering out a little bit here and you're thinking about a renovation anyway. This may be one way to do it by taking that hay crop off. Hey, at least you got you know one crop off that field. Uh, going in and terminating that, and then kind of diversifying things a little bit uh, by putting a warm season complex blend in that can be that can be grazed uh, later in the season and really extend that grazing season. And we see that just work really well. And then down the road, what we're also seeing now, three, four, five, six years later is that when we go in and diversify those plant communities by doing something like that, it really stimulates the soil microbes. And when we get that next seeding of perennial hay plants, that grass and you mix in there, uh, boy, it just seems to come on so much stronger. We've got some side-by-side -side comparisons we've watched over the years, and it's just very, very uh, encouraging how much that, that boost in soil microbial health really pays off with forage production down the line. Okay, very good. Here's a, here's a question. This person has an old worn out pasture with some rocks and some brush stumps. Would it be better to plow it under and drill or broadcast the seeds 
whether cover crop or just adding diversity. I'll bet you like your plow. Uh, I, boy, that sounds tough, like it'd be tough on equipment and tough on diversity. I, again, that sod competition is going to be the key issue here um, and being able to uh, hurt that bad enough. I, on, on these sites that it's that tillage just really isn't a good option because of stumps, because of rocks, because of slope. Uh, I think uh, the best bang for the buck is good grazing management and that's shortening up the amount of time those animals are out there, uh, uh, allowing longer recovery periods uh, on those pasture plants before you put animals back, uh, maybe even waiting until those plants are in the boot to early seed head stage before you graze again have those animals out there for only a short, very short period of time, uh, 24 hours or less would be ideal on any given spot and keep moving them around, uh, get a good rotation going and really watch the recovery times of those plants. You're probably going to get more bang for your buck than you are um, trying to go out and fight with tillage equipment and trying to work that up. The other option is and this is really tricky, it depends on how bad those stumps and rocks are poking up out of the ground, but another option would be going in, taking a grazing off in the spring, terminating it with, with something like glyphosate, just getting rid of that competition. If, as long as you're not certified organic, this may be an option, but terminating it with glyphosate and then going in with a no-till drill that can handle those stumps and rocks if they're not too bad or you can move around in between them and no-till drilling something uh, back in there. That would probably be your best bet. Again, we're We've got to deal with that that sod competition, um, or our chances of success are really going to drop off the map. Okay, here's another question: What's the potential with well-developed cover crop systems regarding fertilizer reductions, water conservation, and runoff reductions? Um, between good and excellent, <laughs> uh, that's a great question, and and. Uh, the longer you go down this path of following the soil health principles that can include the utilization of a cover crop or a cover crop or more than one cover crop to move you forward on this, the better it's going to get over time. We're seeing in four, four five, six years uh, tripling, quadrupling of soil organic matters. When we do that, uh, we could see much better uh, water infiltration rates. We could see much less erosion happening on those sites, and we can also see opportunities to start to trim back on our on our nutrient inputs or fertility inputs, particularly nitrogen. One way to monitor that is through a soil test called the Haney test. Uh, the Haney test is Ward Labs is is one of the options to do that. Uh, the Haney test will it measures the biological activity and a bunch of other things. Uh, but it's going to give you uh, an idea on how much you can cut back, particularly on nitrogen, over time as your soil health improves. So I'd encourage you to use something like that. Um, you know, it all depends on what you're starting with and, and how uh, aggressively you, you pursue uh, uh, using the soil health principles that were talked about early in the talk is going to determine how fast you go and the type of soil you're dealing with. It's going to take longer with sand than it is with some other soil types just because of the low fertility or the low CECs and those sandy soils. But we know we can improve them. We can improve them over time. Uh, there are some people now who, uh, using the soil health principles, um, have taken their soil organic matters from about 1.3, 1.7 to over 11 percent in 15 years. Uh, that's pretty, pretty phenomenal and pretty aggressive. Uh, Fifteen years ago, we didn't think any of this was possible. We thought it was going to take hundreds, if not thousands, of years to do some of this stuff. And yet, we're finding that with good management, we can move it forward very rapidly. And that's when we can really see the payoffs on reduced inputs, increased productivity, drought proofing our property, our, our fields, and our crops uh, can really start to pay off. One of the things that we do see on, on the utilization of cover crops and implementing these soil health building principles is that on the good cropping years, you're probably not going to see the real dramatic uh, improvements, uh, maybe 
say against an English crowd. It's on those tougher years, on those more stressful years, particularly drought years, is where those fields really start to shine. Okay, thank you. Here's a question. For the first two years, do you need to have the same or more nutrients to feed both the cash crop and the cover crop? You may. Um, I, 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 I like your thinking here. You're thinking of your cover crop as a cash crop and wanting to manage it and treat it as such. I think that's great. I think um, there's been some mistakes in the past and people just tossing it out there and think by manage, magic it's going to function on your own. Uh, again, it goes back to soil testing, just basic soil testing. And if you're short on MP or K or sulfur or something like that, or if you need the lime, um, you're probably going to need to do that okay, to move this thing ahead. With time, uh, yes, you should be able to start pulling back on that. Um, again, depending on what you're starting with and how aggressive you are in implementing soil health principles. Uh, but uh, absolutely, uh, those first few years, you may need to use some supplements in order to get that going. Because what we're trying to do is build biomass out there. We want to build biomass. We want that living root out there. We want soil protection and soil armor out there. And if our plants are struggling to survive and grow, we're not going to achieve any of those any of those things and move forward with our soil health goals. So initially, yeah, we may need to use some of those in a soil test as a good place to start. Okay, here's a question about rain. What happens if it rains too much with a cover crop? It would drown out in the low spots is a possibility. Uh, it might wash away like any other crop, uh, especially if we're like aerially seeding into a row crop situation. When we get a hard rain, there's a possibility for some washing and losing some of that down the rows if the rows are, are um, running up and down the slope. Uh, yeah, those are possibilities. Uh, the bigger crop seems to be, uh, especially in some of these row crop sites where we're, we're basically broadcast seeding, whether that's aerial or whatever, and the seed's just sitting in the ground, is we get enough moisture to germinate, but the soil's basically dry, and we only get enough moisture to germinate, but not enough to get it really going. So you get that little plant germinated, then it's dry out there, poof, the thing dies. Uh, that's probably our worst case scenario that, that I've seen or heard about. Okay, I'm going to take that question a little bit farther. What happens if it's too wet when it comes time to destroy or get rid of that cover crop? Well, it depends on how you're going to use it. If you're going to graze it and you're going to graze it in the fall, wait till the ground freezes if you're in a northern climate. If you're in a southern climate, ooh, I don't know. Um, I haven't worked too much uh, in climates where it doesn't freeze in the fall, so I can't help you if your your question is pertaining to somewhere down south, like Florida or Georgia or something. Uh, you probably just have to wait for it to dry. Uh, if you're going to... Uh, if you were thinking about something like triticale or rye and you're terminating it in the spring and you're going to follow it with, for example, say planting of soybeans, yeah, that's a stinker. Uh, you know, now we're just we're in the same situation as we are in, you know, like some of these prevent plant situations we've seen in the Midwest the last two years because of cold wet springs. Uh, again, we, we are uh, at the mercy of the weather on so much of our egg systems, and uh, this one really will be an exception, but uh, if it's something like in the fall, if we get a wet fall and you can't get cattle out there, you're concerned about pugging, wait till it freezes. Uh, a lot of these, for example, these brassicas will go down into the single digits uh, before they're terminated, uh, and they can stay green and lush and very nutritious. Uh, sometimes even into January, that ground can be firm enough to support them. Uh, support animals, but it still hasn't killed those plants. So it's still grazable, it's still usable, that may be an option. Uh, another option would be uh, uh, aerial application of, of an herbicide of Roundup, of glyphosate, uh, may be an option if it's too wet to get in there, uh, but then we do need to dry that field out in order to get it and plant something else. So again, we're at the, the, the mercy of the weather to some degree.
Okay, here's one. Do you know of anyone trying biochar with a cover crop? I do not. Uh, that's an interesting concept. Uh, I am I am not working in the biochar world these days, so I really don't have a good answer for you. Uh, maybe a Google search will turn up somebody, but uh, interesting concept. Um, there are some people, though, using uh, some of the humic uh, acid uh, uh, products that are out there. Uh, not the same as biochar, but uh, that is another supplement that folks are another carbon source that people are looking at applying and, and, and with covers and, and that's something fairly new. I haven't seen any data on that yet. It's just something I'm hearing, hearing about being tried here for this upcoming year. Can you talk more about the low seeding rates of cover crops? There is a large group of people who don't want to overseed for reasons such as too much competition with cash crop and too much cost. Low seeding rates. Um, well, uh, just for example, in, in let's say a corn silage situation, uh, we can often get by with just a few pounds an acre of something broadcast at B5, B6, uh, and it's fairly expensive. You're probably going to spend less than $10 an acre on seed. Uh, I've seen a number of innovative ways to get that out there. I've seen homemade drop tube seeders. I've just seen uh, these old hopper, you know, PPO powered or little orbit motor broadcast seeders folks use, and they're just spreading anywhere from three to ten pounds an acre of seed, depending on what's in their blend. Uh, it's when we get into the aircraft uh, use that this 25 to 30 pound per acre tends to be uh, kind of the sweet spot uh, for getting enough out there. Uh, so that's that's a lower seeding, the, the three, four, five pounds an acre is a lower seeding rate. Uh, other people, like for example, in small grains, are putting in about three pounds an acre of like subterranean and crimson or bursine clovers uh, out there, and having that function as a cover crop, and that that can work very well. Uh, I've seen some pretty light applications of brassicas, uh, one to three, maybe four pounds of acres of brassicas with a half rate of oats. Uh, uh, work really well for something in the fall that they want to use as a late fall grazing situation. Uh, so yeah, those are some, some cheaper, lower cost, low seeding rate varieties that folks are having some success with. Okay, getting back to annual rye. If you frost seeded it, will it go to seed? annual rye if you frost seeded it. I'm assuming when they say frost seed, I'm assuming they're saying, you know, going out about this time of year in, in early spring and broadcasting it over frozen ground and the freeze-thaw action uh, is allowing it to make good seed to soil contact. That's, that's how I picture frost seeding. So I'm going to answer Based on that, yes, if you get it in this early, it could go to seed. Okay. Can you provide or are there available elsewhere the rotation, seeding dates, rates, etc., for the examples of cover crops that you provided earlier in your presentation? Uh, let's let's take those one at a time. You may have to help me repeat those again. So we had dates and rates. What were the other ones, Wayne? Yeah, ro the rotation. Rotation. Dates yep. and rates. Okay. And et cetera. So okay. those three. Those three are the big ones. Okay. Well, one of the rotations um, that I've talked about is uh, going from a hay field to a complex cover crop to corn. Uh, the hay field was harvested in mid-June. The complex cover crop mix was seeded in late June. It was grazed off starting in November. 
and then the following early uh, in May, the next year, the corn crop was put in. Uh, as far as rates on that cover crop mix, I would have to go do some checking on that. It was an eight-way blend. We were seeding at about that 125 to 130 percent full seeding rate. Uh, some of the species in that blend were pearl millet, Sudan grass, sun hemp, uh, crimson clover, uh, sunflower, uh, purple top turnip, Winfred hybrid turnip, and I can't think of what the eighth one was right now. Uh, when we use things like, uh, in these complex cover crop mixes of eight or more species, when we use uh, any of the brassicas, uh, when we use corn, when we use sunflowers, like corn and sunflowers, typically down around only a pound an acre in that blend of those species. Brassicas usually one pound or less per acre of those species in the blend. Uh, something like Basilia, uh, and I think that was the eighth species in that mix. Uh, something like Basilia, maybe a quarter to a half pound per acre. Uh, there's very high seed numbers per pound, um, or high seed counts per pound uh, in some of those species. And so it doesn't take a whole lot um, to really add a nice diversity to the mix. Some of the uh, warm season grasses, like the millets, um, the sorghum, sorghum sedan, and so on, uh, were typically in that three to eight pound an acre range uh, on a lot of those things. Um, and if we're looking to build soil organic matter, we'll tend to weigh it heavily towards those. Uh, the legumes, we'll probably want to make sure we have a couple pounds of all the legumes together. But something like, for example, a crimson clover, we'll maybe keep it to about a pound because, again, there's a high number of seeds per acre there. So uh, those are some, some examples. Uh, let's see. Uh, the field pea and oat blend, I think there was about 70 pounds an acre of the pea oat mix there in that blend and then a pound an acre of uh, three or four different brassicas of each one of those species, so there would be a, a total of three to four pounds per acre of that brassica mix. And then there was about a pound or two pounds per acre of uh, crimson clover uh, in there. And there's even folks throwing in a little bit of uh, annual ryegrass in there also uh, for later season grazing on some of those mixes. Uh, let me think. 12-way uh, mix. Uh, again, a lot like the eights, we're going with a pound or less of each of the clovers, of each of the brassicas per acre, maybe a half to a quarter pound of something like cilia, uh, more pounds per acre of, of things like the millets, the sorghums, things like that, because we want, we want the biomass out there, we want the tonnage out there, and maybe if we're going to use corn or sunflower, just a pound an acre of those and anywhere from one to four pounds an acre of things like uh, sun hemp, or oh, maybe five, eight, ten pounds an acre of something like uh, cow pea or uh, orange soybean or something like that. So the, the, that gets you in the ballpark, and if you go on some of those online spreadsheets and start playing around uh, with those, uh, you can start to see where you want to adjust, and that's totally going to be up to your goals and what you're trying to address on that particular field. As far as um, rotation on like the, the field that was in peas, oats, and brassicas, the next year the producer, uh, in order to fit with their bigger rotation, actually put that back into an alfalfa grass blend. But a lot of times these complex cover crop mixes, uh, we can go into something like corn, we can go into sunflowers, we can go into soybeans, there's lots of different things uh, we can use. Again, if you're going to uh, do something like that, uh, if you're going to follow with soybeans, you probably don't want soybeans in your complex cover crop. It's just to help break any pest cycles there. If it's going to be corn, leave the corn out. If it's going to be sunflowers, leave the sunflower out. Um, or 
just some of the rules of thumb there. Did I hit everything, Wade, on that question? Yeah, I think you did very well. Thank you. Okay. Um, is it best to have the same number, such as two from cool season grasses, two from warm season, uh, two cool season broadleaf, and two warm season broadleaf in the cover crop mix? Uh, no, mix it up. And then, again, it totally depends on your field. It depends on what resource issues you're trying to address. Uh, you know, what are your goals there? Uh, what's been there before? What are you going to have there next year? And just because you use something one year doesn't need to be the same the next year. Uh, I've seen a number of people adjust their cover crop blends uh, species-wise because they found something that was cheaper or more available or more readily available. Uh, uh, than something they used the year before. Uh, and that's going to change these prices and availability on some of this stuff changes. I know pearl millet was really hard to find here a couple of years back. Um, the radishes sometimes can get pretty tough and pretty expensive. You know, keep mixing things up. Uh, um, one of the things we're even seeing now is, is uh, some of the uh, pests that we're dealing with in our cropping systems are almost learning how to pattern. I don't want to say they figure it out. I don't know that they're capable of doing that, but they kind of pattern or are able to fall in if, if we get into a, a three crop or four crop rotation. Uh, they kind of get in sync with that. There's some that survive and thrive in that situation that did a few years ago. They adapt to that. So mixing it up, scrambling it up, I think is good. Uh, to help build some of that diversity, but so much of this goes back to your goals and resources. Uh, you may find that uh, you want uh, more legumes in there. You want a high diversity of legumes in there, and so you're going to you're going to build that into your blend. Maybe more so than warm season grasses, and maybe only ones available or ones affordable. Maybe if you leave something out and do more of something else, uh, you could still get some complexity there. Uh, in that blend, but you're making other decisions because of price, cost, or availability, or whatever. So, uh, yeah, you just mix and match and play around with this, and the more you learn with it, the more you can tweak it. Uh, uh, I know people who early on were using a lot of red clover, who don't use much of that more, it tends not to perform well in shade. We found that uh, some of the other annual clovers tend to work a little better, uh, just as an example. Uh, there's a, a new uh, millet that I've uh, learned about just in the last week here uh, out of North Dakota. It came out of Manitoba. It's called gray millet. It's not really uh, readily available, but there is a source for it in North Dakota. We're going to start playing with some of that, see how that works in our situation here since uh, we're in central Minnesota and we're looking for more northern type species. So. Uh, look at what's available, check out different sources, and uh, uh, be willing to experiment a little bit and take notes and, and learn from things and try some different things. And if you get two different fields, maybe try a little different things there and see what works for you and what doesn't. And, and we do know that things are going to change from one year to the next. Boy, one year some things just really outperform something else, and that's totally based on growing conditions that year, seeding dates and so on, can play a huge influence on on how things perform. So just because it doesn't, it isn't the star performer out there one year doesn't mean, you know, to completely toss it out. I think for any of us who have been farming for any length of time, you know, uh, we've done alfalfa seedings that haven't haven't done very well and had to go in and reseed. That doesn't mean we stop growing alfalfa. We still use it. It's still an important part of our cropping systems, especially if we have livestock. Uh, the same thing with cover crops. Just because it doesn't it isn't the top performer one year. There's a lot of factors that play into that. Uh, give it another shot. Give it a couple of years before you toss it out. Maybe then it's not going to work for you. But and then you know, don't break the bank on this stuff. Start small. Start with one field. Uh, start with a few species that fit in your situation. If you've already got a strong crop rotation, maybe you only need uh, a few things in there to diversify things up a couple bit, a couple uh, a little bit. We see. Uh, in southern Minnesota, for example, we've seen just adding cereal rye, flying on a cereal rye crop uh, onto example for corn or soybeans, and just building that into the mix has a huge impact on soil aggregate structure and on and crop production the following year. 
uh, Jerry Ackerman, and maybe Jerry's listening, I don't know, in southern Minnesota, uh, had a very spindly rye crop here a few years ago uh, uh, that he flew into some of his row crops. He didn't do it on the entire field, but only on part of the field. But the uh, he got about a 20 bushel an acre jump in yield just because of that the following year. And just looking at that cover crop, you wouldn't think that was possible or that it amounted to anything and that it was a complete waste of money. And yet he had this very powerful response in, in productivity on that field just because of that little tiny bit of diversification. So I encourage you to just get out there and try and play around a little bit. Don't risk everything on it. Start small. Just do a percentage of the farm. But uh, give it a try and learn as you go. And, and communicate with others. I think there's going to be a lot of field days coming up this summer and into the fall. Uh, find the ones that are in, the, in your area. Talk to other producers who are doing this stuff. Get on mailing lists for like Extension and NRCS. Um, uh, SFA alone is going to have 10, it be going to be involved in 10 different field demonstration sites of complex cover crop mixes uh, in the next, well, this summer for sure, and then probably the next summer because these are multi-year projects. So come on out, check some of these out, and compare notes. We're all still learning on this stuff. Um, we're all at different stages of learning, and just because something works on my farm, it may not work on yours. Things might be just a little bit different. Uh, but that's part of the beauty of the system is it's not a recipe. It's something that we can adapt. And, and learn how to make it work uh, for our particular situation. Okay, here's a comment with a question. Seems there are basic things that most elevators have, like winter rye, and then the more unusual varieties not generally available locally. What are the best sources for cover crop seeds? Well, I'm glad you made that comment. That's a great point. And, and um, you know, I think if your elevator or local seed source doesn't have it, um, at least ask. The more of us who ask, pretty soon they're going to go, oh, you mean there's a market for whatever. You know, that may be triticale, daikon radishes, sun hemp, whatever, if they hear folks looking for this stuff. Uh, unfortunately, there is no one-stop shopping for all of these things. There are several seed sources that carry a large uh, array of these, but I have yet to find somebody who carries everything right now, and I don't know that we ever will because there's so much stuff out there and that's okay. Um, a few of the sources I've worked with that are out there uh, in Minnesota, we've got Albert Lee Seed, uh, has a wide variety of cover crops. Uh, Millborn Seed in Brookings, South Dakota, uh, yeah, really is into the cover crop thing. Agassiz Seed out of West Fargo, uh, they have a lot of cover crop seed. Uh, Welter Seed and Honey in Iowa is another one. And then we already mentioned uh, green cover seed down in Nebraska. Uh, those are some of the big ones. That's not all that's out there. Uh, R.J. Hunt uh, up in central Minnesota, he carries a number of cover crop seed. And that's through, sold through a number of distributors. Uh, I, you know, I'd encourage you to check with your co-ops and your local local sources. And, 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 and if they're willing to work with you on this stuff and they can get this stuff, well, that's a heck of a lot easier than than uh, having it traded in or whatever. Um, and it's just nice to do business local in our communities. So try there first. The more of us who call them and ask for it. Um, I know people, farmers, are pooling together on putting orders together. Uh, several farmers will go together, even if their orders are different. Um, sometimes they can get it blended, bagged, and then put on the same pallet, and you're just responsible for sorting it when the pallets come. Uh, other folks are getting it quantity and totes and doing their own blending. But uh, start networking. Start working with other folks. Start tapping those local sources. And uh, maybe some of them will jump on, on board here uh, as, as we grow uh, the use of cover crops uh, throughout the Corn Belt and uh, start to go, hey, you know, there's an opportunity here. We need to get on board with this thing and start providing this as a service for our producers. Yeah, just to follow up on that, the SFA website has some information, a lot of information on cover crops, as well as there's going to be a new document coming out real soon. Um, it's called it's Beginning Grazers Handbook, and in the back of that, in the appendices, there are going to be a list of vendors, and forage seeds and cover crop seeds, vendors are going to be listed in that. So that will be coming out very shortly. 
Good. Here's a question. How do cover crop seeds get to market? And in terms of supply and demand, might it be worthwhile exploring production of them? Uh, I'm not going to dive too far in how they get to market, but it, uh, that's an excellent point, an excellent question. Uh, a great way to start diversifying your crop rotation is look into the possibility of growing uh, cover crop seed. Uh, look into what grows well in your area. Contact a couple seed suppliers and see if they're interested in working with you or interested in working with new producers and check that out. Uh, yeah, I would encourage you to do that if that's something you have an interest in. As the demand grows, and it has and it is, and we hope it will, um, we're going to have need for more seed producers. So even if it's a matter of just getting on a list, maybe not for this year, but for the following year, it may be something worth exploring. Uh, some of the folks who are doing it are saying it's worked very well for them. It's been very profitable for them. Uh, because of the diversification, they've been able not only to reduce inputs, uh, but they get paid pretty well for a crop that may not need a lot of inputs in order to produce in comparison to something like corn. So, uh, yeah, I'd encourage you to think about that and move towards that. Just start talking with some of those companies, those suppliers, and, and see what they're looking for and, and see if uh, uh, it would be a good fit for uh, the two of you to partner on something like that. Okay, here's a follow-up comment from a question earlier about cover crops grown into vegetables. Um, someone sent in that the person should look at, um, for Jan Hendrick, that's J-A-N dash Hendrick, H-E-N-D-R-I-K, crop, K-R-O-P-P, -P, and he's from Germany, has an extremely innovative no-till system for vegetables using with cover crop mulches and silage mulches. And this person saw the presentation last summer. So that's just some information about that. Excellent. Um, Thank you for sending that in, whoever did that. Appreciate, greatly appreciate that. And here's another question. We're getting down towards the end. Do you ever look at long-range weather forecasts when planning your cropping year with cover crops? Absolutely. Absolutely, um, and, and uh, not that we can fully trust them, but it is part of the piece of the puzzle as I look forward uh, to things, uh, uh, probably more so now than I did in the past, but at least trying to look out, you know, two or three weeks and seeing what the forecast and trying to look at several sources and even just kind of looking at you know, weather maps and weather patterns and what's been going on. I think most of us, you know, after we've been in an area for a time, kind of get a feel for our weather patterns. For example, in central Minnesota, uh, west central Minnesota, it is not at all uncommon to expect five, six, seven weeks with no rain from middle, middle of July to late August, early September. Very, very common. Now, last year that didn't happen. In 2010, that didn't happen, and that was great. Uh, for doing some things. But boy, in a lot of these years, you can kind of see where we lock into this high pressure system after high pressure system. And where is that jet stream located? And, you know, is that fitting with the long term forecast? Or is there some major system coming off the Pacific or whatever that's going to change that and make those decisions accordingly? Not that it's always right, but it can take some of the, you know, maybe take some of the risk out of it. It's, it, again, it's still a guessing game. We're still at the mercy of the weather. I do try and use that as much as possible. Uh, you know, weather forecasts for from if it was given today for August, I'd look at it with a very large grain of salt. Uh, 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 you know, considering things, but I think you know it, it, it's sounding like, for example, for and it's looking like for much of the northern Corn Belt that we're probably going to have an earlier spring than we've had the last two years. Uh, I'm not going to bet the whole farm on that, but uh, certainly starting to think about what my options are uh, and, and, and options for the producers that I'm working with on their cover crop uh, plans uh, on, on what might be possibilities or good possibilities as we go forward. It's been very dry here this winter, uh, but uh, the law of averages and the weather patterns in the past say it's probably going to turn around and we should have some moisture for the spring. If not, we're going to have a whopper of a drought. We don't, none of us want that, but 
uh, yeah, start looking at those things and at least taking it into consideration. Yes, absolutely. Okay, well that's all the questions. Um, this webinar was recorded, so you can listen to it and watch it again. And it'll be posted onto the SFA website. Um, this is a going to the SFA is hosting a series of webinars on soil health, and this is the first one. We're having another one scheduled for April 3rd. The presenter on the topic is yet to be determined, and we have another one in the fall on November Friday, November 6th, and that's with Dr. Alan Williams, who does research and, consult, and consults on cover crops and grazing, and he's going to he will have up-to-date information from the upcoming growing season and cover crop studies in Minnesota and surrounding states that he will have information on that. And also as a way to help us determine if this webinar was useful to you and to help us plan future education events, uh, please reply to a very short survey that will pop up right after this webinar or will be coming to you soon in your email inbox. Uh, thanks again for attending the webinar, and special thanks to Jeff Farbman at the Pasture Project for the technical support for the webinar, and we look forward to you the next webinar on April 3rd. Thanks much, and have a good day. Goodbye.